Tennessee authorities returned seven-year-old Charles C. to his crack-addicted mother without making sure it was safe. He ingested her drugs and has suffered permanent brain damage. Initially, I really did underestimate the magnitude of, of the problem. They just couldn't see the big picture. Well, children's rights could see the big picture, and they had the expertise to try to help the state. No one was minding the store at the Tennessee Department of Children's Services. We went to Tennessee because we knew that children were being harmed by the state and were, were neither being protected nor given a chance for a reasonable childhood. We knew that kids were being brought up in institutions, which is harmful for children, were being moved from place to place and were being denied the opportunity for a permanent family. I'm standing out here at a place that uh, we call TPS. Uh, it's the grounds of the Tennessee Preparatory School. We're on the fringes of a sort of industrial street. Um, there are kitchens in these places. There's a room to watch TV, but they're still institutions. My background in litigation is from primarily corrections. I've been in prisons everywhere in the state. And I don't want to say they were junior prisons, but they were certainly reminiscent of it. And people say, well, you know, they have um, staff that they fall in love with in institutions. Yes, they do. But moms and dads don't work shifts. You know, they are there 24-7 in the, in the context of that, of that family. They don't need to be an institution. So we insisted that the state dismantle this institutional system. That was like priority one. You can't treat no two kids the same because each of them have their own personality. Treat them as an individual. I can't treat them as a group because that's when you lose them. One of the main focuses was to get children out of the government custody and into families so that the adoption rate has really gone up quite substantially, as has the rate of children being returned to their parents. One of the, the major holes in this system was just a complete lack of support of foster parents. And Pearly Cash was no exception. I am the caretaker, mother of nine children. I've had, I know a good 80 children that come through my home. They call me the fat in house because when they left, they were fat and fluffy. <laughs> This was a woman with a very big heart who was willing to take in the children that had no other homes, many of whom came from the same drug-addicted mother. When I first met Pearlie, she had five or six foster kids in her home, and one particular child, Danielle, uh, who became a plaintiff in the lawsuit. Her social worker brought her here when she was three days old. I never forget, she was about that big. And she never showed back up again. This child was six years old. She never, nobody never asked me about that child. Danielle had bad asthma attacks, behavior problems in school and everything. You came through town with the uh, lawsuit and everything. That's when she got a social worker. Along with, I was able to get the medical help that I needed for her and also uh, the assistance that I needed in school. I think it's a great thing to be a foster parent, but you gotta have a good backup behind you, especially when you're a single person. In order to produce better results for kids, to give them a chance for a better life, there needs to be a system at work that will ensure that those results take place. So no system can protect children if it has high caseloads and lack of training and no way of figuring out what's actually happening to or tracking children, no good processes for making decisions for children. That was absent in Tennessee when we filed suit. It is now very much a part of the Tennessee system. You couldn't do for 43 kids what you could do for 20. You didn't have time. So everything that you did was the bare minimum. When you have cases that were sky high like ours were, it's just too hard 
to manage it all. We had no data tracking system. I had nowhere to go to look and see where my children being visited. There would be handwritten notes, they'd be front and back, you couldn't find information. Now we have data systems in place that allow us to measure absolutely everything. You almost can't think of something that we aren't measuring in Tennessee. Medical, uh, psychological appointments, medication, face-to-face -face visits, visits with the parents visit with siblings because sometimes the siblings were placed apart. The reason that states, I think, resist these lawsuits is because they don't want to really be held accountable. Uh, they don't want to be measured on their results. Uh, and states know that when we bring a lawsuit and we win, we're going to be watching what they're doing and seeing whether they really produce results for kids. And we're not going to go away until they do. They want the same thing for kids and families that I want. I, I don't want to kid you for a minute. They keep their foot in my back. This has not been easy. But would we have made the kind of progress that we've made at the speed that we've made it without uh, children's rights and the, the pressure of having that consent decree? There's no way we would have, I, I don't think. You think that it's over, that the case is over, but it's not over. It's a, every day you have to keep at it because this, there's this inertia that you think the state has and they have an anti-inertia. They keep going backwards. First of all, it's just the whole idea of federal courts telling state governments what to do. And I don't like that either. I've said that before. It doesn't feel good. You fight them in the press. You fight them in the courts. You fight them in the legislature. You do not surrender. When they realize that it's cheaper and easier to deal with you across the table than to fight you in court, then you can get something done. States do need to reform their public child welfare systems. Uh, nobody, you can't argue that. When you look at um, adults, uh, children who have aged out of the system and the outcomes that, that, that you get for those kids, how can you argue? You don't want children's rights to come filing a lawsuit. You get these Yankees down here, they're going to change your whole system. The good results in Tennessee can be replicated in other states if there's pressure in these states, in fact, to protect these children and do a better job. That takes resources, that takes staffing, that takes experts, that takes all of the work that we do, and that takes funding to be able to do it. We need the resources to be able to, to do what we're doing in Tennessee in more places. There are just hundreds of thousands of kids in child welfare systems that need help, need someone to advocate for them. They do not vote. They are not a strong constituency. They don't have an all-powerful lobby that state officials listen to. There has to be a voice for them. Children's rights is that voice, and we've got to be able to keep doing that because no one else is standing up for these kids. It's like when you have a big family, you can enjoy eating together and playing together, and we just have a great time. We love her. We want to show her that we need her, but like anything she tell you to do, you should do it, because this is the best mom I've seen before, and I love her very much. Los Angeles officials investigated the case of a five-year-old boy who was abused and tortured by his mother and babysitter. A one-year-old boy suffered severe burns to his little feet during a bath in a state-run shelter in Oklahoma. A two-year-old boy in Texas who was killed by his mother was not supposed to be left alone with her, and state officials are unable to explain why that happened. An Ohio woman and her boyfriend placed their children in a dog cage and put a shock collar around the neck of their 10-year-old. I am Anna J. I am Dolores J. I am Tyrone J. I am Marissa W.